In this video, we're going to take a look at another one of the challenges from the Leet Up Live CTF. It's a web challenge called My Music. It was created by Home, and the description says, check out my new platform for sharing the tunes of your life. So this challenge only got 10 solves during the CTF, so let's go and see how difficult it is. We go through to My Music, we've got the Spotify link on the page, and it says here, head over to the profile page to get started, and it asks us to log in with a login hash. I'm going to go to register then, because we don't have anything like that yet and I'll just put in some default values. We do that and now we actually have a login hash on the screen and we've got this Spotify link as well where we can adjust the tracking link. And we can also generate a profile card. So let's start by testing the functionality of this button. If we click it, it'll open a new link, generate profile card, and then it comes back with a PDF document where it has embedded our link, our tracking link, and also our name as well. So the first thing we might want to do here is see if we can inject something into the parameters that we control. Let's go back. We can't update our username. Let's go and add some tags here. So I'm just going to try and make this bold. Take a copy of that, do the same for last name, and then let's just do the same here as well. Update our profile. It says it's successfully updated. So let's try and generate that again. And notice that this time, we haven't got the bold cat in our name, first name and last name, but we do have bold in the tracking link. Let's also go over to Burp Suite. If you want to track what's actually happening with the requests and responses, then we probably want to update our settings a little bit in Burp. Let me go. So we're in the HTTP history tab. We've got a lot of stuff here from like Spotify, which makes sense because we've got a Spotify tracking link, and then also just some other sites that we have open and Firefox and things like that. So let us go and change the scope. I'm actually going to add my music. Let us add this to scope. Do we want to continue sending out of scope items? Yeah, we'll keep sending them, but we're going to go and update this and say that we only want to show the in scope items. Click apply. And now we've only got this fav icon. Let me go to not proxy settings. Let us go to our scope. So target scope settings. And let's just edit this. We want to get all of the requests for this domain. All right, back to the proxy. And now we're seeing all that stuff, but we're not actually seeing the PDF generation. And we can go and test that again. If we click generate and go back to burp, we, we get the post request initially, but we're not going to get anything back here with the PDF. And the reason being, we actually aren't filtering the right type. So at the moment, if there's anything that comes back as an image or other binary, it won't actually show in the requests and responses. So if we now do that, let's go generate profile card. And this time we get the post request. And you can see that we have our PDF in the response. So we don't really need to do that in this case. It's just in case you're working on a challenge where you are doing something like this, and maybe you are interested in the request parameters or what's coming back in the response, maybe some of the headers, something like that. And you don't actually see them in Burp because you have it filtered to not show images or other binary or whatever content type you're interested in. But anyway, now that we've sorted out our Burp settings, let's go and see what else we might be able to inject into the Spotify tracking link. Well, since we were able to inject HTML, maybe we'd try to inject some JavaScript as well. There's actually an article on Hattricks on server-side XSS dynamic PDF. And that's basically what's happening here. We've got a PDF generator, which is allowing us to inject HTML. Next thing we want to try is inject in some script, although as it says here, that script tags don't always work and you might need to use like image or something like that. So you'll find a variety of payloads to use here, which you can try out. And the payload that we're going to use, first of all, let's go back to my music and let me just take a copy of this one. So we're going to try and find out what the file structure is of the PDF that we're creating. So we're using document.body.append and we are looking for the location link. We'll click update. Let me close down this. I'll move this over here and let's generate a new profile card. And here we go. We have found the location of the file which is being created. So we've got the file name, but more importantly, we've got the directory structure as well. So we know that this is actually going into slash app. And then in this case, for this file, it's going into temp, but maybe we've got some other directories or files in app, which would be interesting to look at. So we could go back to hat tricks or something similar to try and find a payload like this one. 
And maybe we would want to automate this process, look through some common files like app.js, index.js, or just using like a word list that you find on set lists. Although I think that needs to be like a two-stage macro in Burp Suite if you wanted to automate that to see which files are readable. But in this case, it's app.js. So app is quite lightly, index.js is also quite lightly. You will get other file names, but they're two of the most common that we would be interested in. So let's do update, let's generate the profile card again. And at first it doesn't look like we have anything, but if you scroll down a little bit, you'll see that we have actually recovered the source code for app.js. So it is already indented, but I like to get some syntax highlight and I'm gonna take a copy of this and I'm gonna open up app.js in VS Code or whatever you like to get your syntax highlighting in. And there we go. Now we can just see a little better what is going on. And there isn't too much going on here, but we do have this import here. We've got roots index and roots API. So that's some new files we can go and check out. Let's go back to our profile and let's change this to app slash roots slash already forgotten what they were. One of them was index and the other was API. Again, we'll update and then we'll go and generate the profile card. Okay, we scroll through and we've got some more code to look at. Let's also remember that we also need to check out the API. Get our syntax highlighting again. And we've got some more code this time. So we can see that we've got our register endpoint, which is going to take our user data to create a new user. We've also got login, which was going to take the login hash. We saw that whenever we logged in and that will return that user data as well. We can log out, we can check our profile and we can generate a profile card. We've already seen that. This is the other part that we didn't see is the admin endpoint. And this makes it very clear that this is our goal to receive the flag. So it's gonna check if we are the admin before it's gonna return the flag. And I guess we could just go and have a look. Um, let me keep this page open because I wanna keep that payload there. But let's go and try admin, see what we get. And it says only admins can view this page. So there's our goal. We need to become admin or find some way to read the content of this endpoint. It's also revealed some new routes that we want to check out. So we've got this endpoint here, middleware auth, we've got check admin, which sounds very interesting. We've got utils, recommended songs, and we've got utils, generate profile cards. So we want to go and map out the application, see what each of these files is doing so that we can identify where the vulnerability is. But before we do that, let's go and take a look at the other files. So we also had the routes api.js. Let's open that up. You would want to note down each of these endpoints as you find them. I already have them noted down on another monitor, so I don't need to do that. So I'm just going to replace the code that we find or replace the code that we have with the code that we find and sort out the syntax. And there we go. So this is our API and we have a register function it takes in the parameters that we saw whenever we create a user and we've got a login function. And that's it, nothing particularly interesting here. But again, we've got some new endpoints. So we have controllers slash user, and these functions have been imported. One of them is to update user data and get user data and authenticate. So maybe one of these files or one of these functions has some interesting code in it. So let's find out. Let's go back to our profile again, and let's change this to controllers and user.js. So we have an add user function, which we saw it's going to log in using that login hash. We've got get user data, which we can see is going to call this get user function with the login hash. And then it's going to pass the JSON data. So our user object is stored as a JSON file and we can update user data. We've already seen how to do that with our Spotify track code and other parameters. Again, not too much of interest here, but we can see that we also have services user. So again, let's go back and see what that does. And this one shows us more about how users are stored. So one thing of note is the data folder. So this is where the users will be stored. So now we know that the app is in slash app and then the user data is in slash data. And we also know that the user file is that hash that we see whenever we log in dot JSON. So if we go back to our profile, 
we basically know that our user is currently stored at slash app slash data that json uh sorry that hash dot json and that is where our user object is stored potentially useful because we know that if we can update the user in some way we should be able to get access to that admin endpoint all right well nothing else particularly interesting here let's go to what is likely to be one of the most interesting files which was the check admin function so we'll go to middleware slash check underscore admin dot js Okay, so as expected, this is a more interesting file. We can see that this is how we are denied access to the admin page. So we've got this try catch, and it's going to take the it's going to create this user data object by passing the JSON data in our file. So we know we've got that JSON file. It's going to pass that, and then it's going to check if the is admin property of that JSON object is not true. Then it's going to send us a 403 and say only admins can access the page. And it's going to return. So at this point, we might be thinking, how could we inject is admin true into that JSON object, which we can control, right? Whenever we create a user, we control the input that goes in there. And that's a good question. Another question is, what happens if this JSON data can't be passed? Because we've got this pass call, and then it's going to try to do an if statement on the data that's in there. But presuming that this fails and comes out with some kind of error, it's just going to skip this whole if statement, right? So it's going to catch the error and then it's going to go next. But if it skips the if statement, where's the code to deny us access to the page? Maybe that gives you some idea. Let's continue and see how we can finish solving the challenge. And actually, what we want to do here is revisit one of the other files that we had earlier, which was the roots index.js. And let me see if I can find it. I think it was one of the first ones that we checked. That's the API. This one. Okay, so this one, we have the profile generate profile card, which is going to await the generate PDF function. It's going to take the user data. And then what's this? It's going to take request.body.user options. So we want to go and find out what that is because that's where the PDF is being generated. And we can do that by going and having a look at this file, utils generate profile card. So another file that we're going to go and check the source code of. OK, so we can see that we've got this generate PDF function. It takes in the user data and the user options. Let's try and find out where these are used. It is down here. So we've got a puppeteer process, which is going to be opening up Google Chrome. And we are going to generate a PDF. The PDF function is going to take in these options. And these options comprise of the options here, which is the format of the PDF, and also the user options. So some options that we are able to control will be injected, will be inserted into the options used in this PDF generation. OK, so let's go and take a look at the Puppeteer PDF documentation. We've got the PDF options. We want to try and find out what parameters it takes. And we can scroll through. There's actually not too many of them. One, which sounds interesting, is the path. So it takes a path of string type, and that's the path to save the file to. So by default, it's undefined, which means it won't write it to disk. But if we can control this path, we can control where the PDF is written to. All right, so just a quick recap. Let us go back to the source code that we had there previously. Uh, not this one. Let's go back to... Oh, I already undid all that stuff. Okay, let me just give a quick recap without the source code. So we want to try and go to that admin endpoint. And let's go back here. We want to try and go to the admin endpoint. Whenever we go here, it's going to try and pass our user data object, which we know where that's stored. And then it's going to see, does it have a property called is admin and is that set to true? However, we also saw that if for some reason it's unable to pass the JSON, so if it triggers an error, then it's likely to skip that whole code block, which actually redirects us away from the admin page and says we're not authorized. So since we know that we can write a PDF and we can control the path, what if we overwrite our user object with a PDF, which is, of course, invalid JSON? Then hopefully that code will never be reached, which redirects us away from the admin page.
And that's it, let's give it a go. So we need our login hash and then we need to generate a profile card. I'm gonna intercept this request. I'm gonna go back to Burp into our interceptor, turn that on and generate the profile card. It's gonna wait for my input. And down here, I'm gonna go and paste in, actually, no, that's not enough. What I need to paste in is, in fact, I'll not paste it, I'll just type it so that everybody can see exactly what's going on here. So we're creating a JSON object and then we want our user options, which is the parameter that we're able to control. And then we wanna set what the options are. And one of the options was the path. And we wanna set that to be the hash that we just grabbed. So let me grab that, but also it needs to be that location, right? So it was app, data, and then the hash, and then .json. The only other thing is we also need to make sure the content type is right here. So this is currently a form. We need to change that to application slash JSON and then forward the request. We can turn off our intercepts and that's going to generate the profile card, but we don't care about that. We wanna see if we can now access the admin page and we can't. Let's go back and see what went on there. Let me take a copy of this. Let's try and log out. I think we might need to log back in to refresh this. So we'll paste that in, log in, and it redirected us, so that's interesting. Let's go to admin, and there's our flag. One thing to know is it doesn't actually matter what the name of that JSON object was. So if we go back to our HTTP history, where is it? Oh, because I modified that, I don't think it shows the modified version. Okay, well, basically we put in the hash of our user but you could just put in that hash of, of whatever you want. So you could just put like cat as the file name. And then whenever we go to try and log in, we log in with cat because we don't really need to overwrite our user. We just need to create a user file, which we know the name of, which is invalid. And that's enough for us to get around that. All right, hopefully that all made sense. I think this was a pretty cool challenge from home. And just to recap quickly, so we were able to log in and use the generate PDF function to trigger server-side XSS so we could start reading files. And then we found that our user options, user controlled parameters are passed to the PDF function in Puppeteer. And by checking out the documentation, we saw that actually using one of those user options, we can control where the PDF is written to. And since we already were able to read files, we found out that our user objects are stored in app slash data and we know what the file structure was the file name and things like that so we just overwrote the user object with a corrupt value i.e something that wasn't json and that was enough to bypass the check so that whenever we try to access the admin page it looks for that property it gets an error and that just skips the whole code block giving us access to the flag Anyway, that's going to wrap it up for this video. I hope you've enjoyed it. If there are any other videos that you want to see from the CTF, let me know. I'm not too sure how many we'll do at this stage because we probably want to move on to some other content. But if there's anything particular that was missed or that you didn't find a write-up for, let us know in the comments.